Hey guys, welcome to this very special episode in which I take on the challenge of reimagining history. I read many online forums over the years talking about Led Zeppelin carrying the show into the 1980s had John Bonham not passed away on September 25th. Because I did a 15 episode post Led Zeppelin 1980s YouTube series, I will use my knowledge to create the most realistic timeline within the alternate universe, a what if situation brings. This will not be wishful thinking, but objective fiction, based on the events and internal dynamics of the rock and roll enterprise. The Zeppelin concluded their 14 concert tour over Europe with mixed results, but an overall feeling of coming back into a competitive game. Robert changed his mind about touring America, thus plans got underway with a very specific list of conditions, or rules. No more than a month away from home, nor playing more than two shows back to back, with a proper day off. He didn't want to play big venues like Silver Domes, King Domes, nor Super Domes. Robert wanted to connect with the audience rather than feel isolated. Despite Peter Grant himself not being in optimal business conditions, he remained a manager determined to keep his group at the top of the food chain of rock and roll. With this being said, the scene was changing and the coveted American market was a prize for all bands participating in the album and concert wars. By the time the Zeppelin played their last show in Berlin, they hadn't been to America in two years and 11 months, their longest absence from the ticket holders that loved them the most. Peter Grant made arrangements for a 19-day tour of North America, including a couple of East Coast venues that were amongst the six cancelled dates of 1977, such as Pittsburgh Civic Arena and Chicago Stadium. The tour's name of the 1980s Part 1 was given as a strategy for future West Coast shows in 1981. Many people have questioned the reasons behind their American comeback. Besides money, there was also power and keeping themselves in the game. Now, there has been speculation by famous Zeppelin authors on John Bonham's physical and mental state at the time. While Bonzo was outspoken in his refusal to return to America, with the memories of Oakland 1977 still fresh, this was a ban after all, and the willingness of all participants was a collective effort. John was responsible for getting Robert back in the band, never mind recording an album. The Cut the Waffle approach of Tour Over Europe 1980 revealed great drumming moments, as well as concerning events like Nuremberg, where Bonzo collapsed after three songs over food poisoning, something that other sources claim to be an alleged result of extended partying from a couple of days hitting German discotheques and bars. Having the toughest job in rock and roll took a toll on Bonham. He was not in a very healthy place, nor was Jimmy, who despite wearing more adult-looking clothing on stage, was living on borrowed time. Swan Song sent a press release to various media outlets making it official that Zeppelin's North American return was good to go. Two rehearsals ran from September 24th through October 3rd. The set list was pretty much the same as Europe 1980, with a small and very important adjustment. Because the band had some concerns on how America would react to the chorus line, All My Love was replaced by the synthesizer epic Carouselambra, with Jimmy Page using the 12 string neck on his Gibson EDS 1275. They placed the song just before Stairway so everybody was warmed up to undertake the 10 minute task and also keep Jones on the same keyboard position. Hot Dog remained a good transition piece whose references to Texas seemed tongue in cheek for their American return. Sink Again was also considered on the set, but their last attempt at Napworth was more than a year ago, so they decided against taking any chances. Encores for the tour were the same as Europe. Heartbreaker and communication breakdown. No acoustic set was rehearsed. The band traveled to Canada on the week of October 13th to conduct a proper sound check scheduled for October 16th at the Montreal Forum, which had a busy concert schedule for 1980. You had Aerosmith and Rush in January, John Denver in March, John Mayall, Johnny Winter, and April Wine in April. The Who on May 7th, Nazareth, Billy Joel, and Genesis in June, Peter Gabriel, Van Halen, Cats, and ACDC in July, Journey, Chip Trick, The Doobie Brothers, Queen and Yes in August, Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, Elton John in September, and Gary Newman touring his new album, Telecon, on October 15th.
The Zeppelin's tour of 1980 was played through fall, a first for the band in America since 1969. It had been a very long time since they saw the colors of autumn in these East Coast cities while being on the road. Early reports of the band's North American return were positive, with some small concerns over the ambitious parts of the set. Carlos Alhambra had mixed reviews. Many praised the band for embracing modern sounds like Rush and Genesis did. Others were disappointed with the long piece and felt the concert needed the acoustic set back, as quote, They used to do three hour shows, man. The band's October 22nd return to Philadelphia Spectrum since February 1975 was another milestone for the venue. Black Sabbath's Heaven and Hell tour was going through their US leg in October 1980. They played Landover's Capital Center on the 14th, some five days before Led Zeppelin's long-awaited comeback to one of the busiest venues in the business. All three nights were a spectacle of epic proportions, with them playing two encores per show. They followed at Richfield Coliseum for a two-night deja vu of 1977, preceded by Bruce Springsteen, Kenny Rogers, Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cult, and Jethro Tull featuring opening act Whitesnake. Joe Louis Arena was the first time for Zeppelin since their last Detroit visit at Olympia Stadium 1975. Second night was cut short due to Jimmy's food poisoning. Buffalo's War Memorial Auditorium was next. Most recent concerts at this venue included Black Sabbath, The Kinks, Frank Zappa, and Molly Hatchet. Zeppelin's return after 1973 saw an early wrap of the show, with John Bonham collapsing from exhaustion right after Stay Were to Heaven. No encores were played. Past two extra dates of the Spectrum, the band headed for Pittsburgh Civic Arena for the first time since 1975, followed by St. Paul Civic Center on November 9th. Last on the tour was a mirror of 1977, with four nights at Chicago Stadium, catering to excited fans who crowded the box office on September 24th for tickets. Against all odds, the band decides to try All My Love on the third night, and to their surprise, the whole stadium sang along the chorus. The tour was over, back to England to celebrate Christmas. January 1981 began with Ahmed Ertegen trying to reach the ever-recluse Peter Grant concerning their July 1980 agreement in Berlin for a renewed partnership which included a brand new album. Phil Carson was sent by Atlantic Records to the British countryside to track Peter down. Jimmy worked out demos with former Yes Men Chris Squire and Alan White. The project was born out of Atlantic Records' idea of a collaboration album. Robert Plant attends these sessions and doesn't like the material. The project is shelved. The posthumous release of John Lennon's single, Woman, steers the Zeppelin camp into nostalgia and reflection. A meeting is held in February to discuss potential writing and recording sessions for the new album expected by Amit Ertigan. The idea of traveling to Air Studios Montserrat is shut down by Plant, saying he's not going to the Caribbean to make Love Beach Part 2. The band settles for R.A.K. Studios London, with long and hard-rocking jams taking place in March. Plans are put on hold. Looking for inspiration, Robert Plant goes on a small UK tour with the Honey Drippers, April through May of 1981. Recording sessions resume June through July, with two songs laid on tape. Both ideas discarded in 1978 were finally developed into compositions. <laughs> Despite the new material taking shape, long delays in production brought the sessions to a halt once again. Any touring plans in America are discarded after the August 1981 release of the Rolling Stones single Start Me Up, which built their momentum into a massive American tour of 50 shows and 2.5 million ticket holders, playing every major venue possible. With a gross revenue of $25 million, 1981 was the year of the Rolling Stones. A deja vu of 1972 of Zeppelin battling their British counterparts in the concert business was not to be. 
In the meantime, Jimmy Page worked on a soundtrack project for Death Wish 2, while Jones and Bonham enjoyed precious time away from touring with their families. Bonzo was especially happy about this. His hesitation to going back on the road grew exponentially. Robert talked to Peter Grant and the organization of his wish to record a solo album. Ahmed Ertigan tried to intervene. Plan threatened to quit the band. Work in Pictures at 11 began in September 1981 with Phil Collins playing drums on five tracks. A conversation between Plan and Collins was pivotal for Robert, who felt pressured by the Zeppelin expectations. Phil reminded him that he was still in Genesis while developing his solo career, thus living in the best of both worlds was possible. Ahmed Ertigan expected a new Zeppelin record for 1982, following the footsteps of the Stones' most recent album, Tattoo You, made up of outtakes. An executive decision was made by Led Zeppelin for Jimmy Page to go deep into the archives and come up with an album. Past the release of Death Wish 2 and Pictures 11 via Swan Song, it was a turn for Coda, Led Zeppelin's ninth studio album. The title represented a change of seasons, the end of an era, and the beginning of a new chapter for the band. This was the 8-track listing released in November 1982. You had 5 tracks either recorded or written on the sessions for In Through the Outdoor, plus Walter's Walk with 1981 overdubs, 1970's Poor Tom, and Barnum's personal showcase, Bonzo's Montro, with the press calling it the Moby Dick of the 80s. Sales were promising, but some reviews called it a disjointed effort with a one-sided dynamic leaning towards hard rock. The 1980s continued with Robert Plant touring the world in 1983 through 1985, making him too busy for any Zeppelin tours to be conducted, much to Peter Grant's concerns for the business. Jimmy Page played the arms show, and everybody asked him the same question. Did Zeppelin break up? Distribution problems and lack of development of new talents led to the demise of Swan Song Records, shutting its stores in 1983. Any one word or two words or three words which sum up that <laughs> era? Oh, it was a very dramatic period, very exciting, and uh, something I wouldn't have changed one second of for anything. And then 1982 saw the solo performance, yeah, and beginning. that being the first release. So Robert, who were you surrounding yourself with in those early days of setting out on the solo performance, and were you scared? Oh, I was petrified. I mean, I've, I entered a world which I knew very, very little about. I'd lived uh, pleasantly with Led Zeppelin for years, <clears throat> and when I started off on my own, I realized I had to manage myself, that the times had changed, that I had to become a part of things that I had very little knowledge about at all. My reputation now is, is good enough for very few people to poo-poo, you know. I'm not going back and doing old songs for the sake of it and for the dollar. I'm uh, angst-ridden, but, <laughs> but doing what I like to do. <clears throat> so it gives me a lot of opportunity to work with new people or old people. Or I get a lot of pleasant phone calls from all sorts of areas of music now. All I've got to do now is convince European DJs that what I've got to offer is worth playing lots and lots, you know, instead of harking on the past all the time. Robert Plant got a solo spot on Live Aid 1985, and slowly but surely, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones got the call to play a guest star appearance with Robert's band. John Bonham declined to participate as he wanted Led Zeppelin to play in full. Things got ugly when the organization threw in Tony Thompson and Phil Collins on drums plus MTV calling it a Led Zeppelin reunion, much to Robert Plant's annoyance. By 1988, a second attempt at getting the band together on Atlantic's 40th anniversary show had unexpected news in the ways of John Bonham's health deteriorating. Bonzo made a very special and personal request to Paige, Plant and Jones. He asked for them to play with his son Jason as a way of honoring their legacy and past memories. Joined by their brotherhood and supporting their friend in these complicated times, they all agreed, and Jason was in for one evening of Kashmir, Misty Mountain Hop, Heartbreaker, Hotel Love, and Stairway to Heaven. The inevitable rumors about a Led Zeppelin reunion were shut down by Robert Plant, but a renewed interest for the band slowly built up in late 1988 all the way through 1989. The remasters box that was released in 1990, with previously unreleased tracks including two live cuts, We're Gonna Groove and I Can Quit Your Baby from Royal Albert Hall, 1970. So here you have it guys, this was my video essay on one of the greatest what ifs of the Led Zeppelin story. I would like to know your thoughts and personal theories on the comment section below. What do you think happened after 1980? And what do you think happened after 1990 in this alternate timeline? Thank you very much for watching, bye bye.